When I was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck, and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room for $300 in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man, and he rented the additional rooms upstairs to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs, and that he preferred women because he had issues with male roommates in the past, partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look at it since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent house, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle-aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom loves to talk and get to know people, so they were engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We head towards the staircase to go up, as I thought, since he said on the phone my room was upstairs with the other roommates, but he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens a door to a very small room. No closet and no windows. He proceeds to say this is my room and I will be sharing the bathroom in the hallway with him. And his bedroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking, absolutely not. This is weird. But they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us to the upstairs and shows us the other rooms, which the doors were open, and says they are currently rented. He then starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories, describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three rooms in the bathrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there that looked like it belonged to a woman. No clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around his tenants' rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind. And I'm just like, uh, why the hell would a tenant pay you for you to use their storage space? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we first arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation the next week, but I couldn't go because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come by the next week and have dinner with him and the roomies to see if we would all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we got in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be living there. She was dumbfounded. I had to explain to her not only did he lie about the room I would be in, that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him as well as share a bathroom with him, and he didn't even have a damn door, but also did she not notice how no one else even lived there. She still didn't get it and thought I was just being paranoid and thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and get him to tell her by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day, he removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at dinner, or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room that had no way to escape. I hope that guy hits a tree with his car one day. A few years ago, I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately, it was kind of far from the university I'd been accepted into, so I'd been trying to find a place to rent close to my university. My dad helped me and showed me an ad on Craigslist. It was a nice looking house for rent, and it was close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting to go check out the place. I showed up in the afternoon, and unfortunately, I was alone. My dad said I was an adult and a big guy, so I shouldn't worry about meeting this person. This old guy greeted me and then says, You'll have to follow me to get to the house for rent. I was confused and said, Your dad said that this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? This is my house. 
I'll take you to the one that's for rent, he says. I'm a little concerned at this point and followed him to his other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I'd just leave. We get there and I notice this house looks bad and it looked like people were in it. I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed odd. He looks at me and says, don't you want to check it out? I don't know. This isn't what was in your ad, and it looks like other people are there, I replied. He tells me that other people are checking it out, and I could join them. Something just felt weird about the whole thing, and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked in bad shape from the outside, and appeared to have people in the house. When he asked why I wasn't interested, I told him it was too far of a drive for school and work. He got mad at me and accused me of wasting his time. I said, I'm not the one advertising a house and then telling the person it's not the one for rent. He began to glare nervously towards the house and asked if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. I told him no and left. He never contacted me again, thankfully. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but something just felt wrong. Maybe he was just trying to show me the house, but I didn't like that he lied about the house to begin with and that there were people inside the house. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I really didn't want to find out. I also didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking if I was sure I didn't want to go check it out. It seemed so bizarre how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside. About a year ago, I moved my family and I to a new home out in the woods in Tennessee. I wanted to be brief here, but I need to get this off my chest, and after looking into this matter a little more, I have a lot more details that I think will paint a clear picture in the end, so please bear with me. The nights here can be extremely loud. Between the crickets, the tree frogs, and the cicadas, it can almost be deafening. One night, not too long after we moved in, I'd forgotten something in my car and headed outside to get it. The first thing that struck me as odd was that my dog wouldn't go outside with me. My dog goes everywhere with me as I'm her whole world, but not this night. As I held the door open, she looked out and then looked up at me like no. So, I walked out and shut the door behind me. The second thing that caught me off guard was that there was not a peep. It was dead silent. I still shrugged this off and walked down my front steps and headed to my car. When I'd gotten about ten feet from my car, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt as though something was watching me. I looked around but saw nothing. After I reached in my car for what I'd forgotten to grab earlier, I had this feeling like something was moving towards me. I took a step back and checked around me. All of a sudden, I heard one of the hedges next to me that lined the walkway to our front door rattle. At first, I thought it was a rabbit that I'd spooked, as I had seen one just earlier in the day right where this was. A few seconds later, I heard the sound of a large rock landing a few feet away from me. It hit the walkway and bounced into a shrub. I drew my gun and called out, and said whoever that this was is about to be shot. After a few seconds of nothing, I began to think that maybe this was some local teenagers messing with the new people. I holstered my sidearm, turned and started walking back to my front door. Almost as soon as I turned towards my house, I heard this deep, panting sound. It sounded like a huge dog, but what made me nope back to my front door was that it sounded like it was right behind me. I leaped up onto my porch, turned, and drew my gun again, expecting something right there. But again, there was nothing. A couple of weeks later, I was on my porch at night, sitting on a bench with my wife. She got up and walked inside to get something, and as soon as she shut the door, I heard that panting sound again. I couldn't see anything, yet this sounded like it was right on top of me. 
the sound was coming from everywhere, and it was very loud. Again, I couldn't see anything, so I noped back inside my house. Now at this point, I was questioning moving here, but after nothing else really happening, I let it go. A month or so later, it was a really rainy and stormy night. This was around 9pm, and my wife and I enjoy listening to the rain and talking about how relaxing the rain is. Me, growing up in Oregon, loved the rain, and for the past 10 years we lived in Vegas where it would dump the entire year of rain in a day, then be bone dry for the rest of the year. For my wife, who grew up in Nevada, rain was such a rare thing. She loved going outside and watching the rain. So, for us, this is an enjoyable experience. Except this night in particular, things took a weird turn. As we were sitting there talking about the rain and relaxing, my wife stops me and said, Did you hear that? No. What did you hear? I asked. I swear it sounded like a small child calling for help out in the woods beside our house, she said. No, I didn't hear anything, I replied. After a few moments of us listening intently, she said, There it is again. I didn't hear a thing, sweetie. Are you sure you're not just hearing things? I told her. She looked at me offended that I didn't hear anything and said, No. I'm positive. How could you not hear that? It was our son. I think he's out there and got lost. No, he's in the house sleeping on the couch, I replied. We then both looked through the blinds that were open right behind us, and we could see all of our children laying there. That's so weird. I swear it sounds like our son, my wife said. Well, it isn't him. He's right there. Besides, I don't hear anything, I told her. She then stands up and says, Well, he's really crying out for help. I need to go look for him. Now at this point, if you knew my wife, you would know she's absolutely creeped out by the woods and wouldn't be caught dead walking into them during daylight, much less at night during a storm. I grabbed her hand and said, I've been listening intently and there's absolutely nobody calling out for help. You need to stay here. And at this point, I'm getting worried about her. She was acting completely out of character, not to mention that at this time, she was eight months pregnant with our baby daughter. She then says, what if there's some child out there lost in the woods? Well, first off, I would be able to hear them too. Secondly, there are no other kids around here for miles and the odds of them being lost a hundred feet from our house that's lit up like a Christmas tree is nil, I told her. I know, but what if it's a kid, she says. Before I could say anything else, she stands up and starts walking towards the stairs. I jumped up and grabbed her hand again and said, No, you're not. Get in the house. I don't know what's going on, but you need to go inside. She then complies, and we both go inside. I didn't know what that was, but it freaked me out. A few months after this, just as it was getting dark outside, I heard the front door to our house open, and I got up to investigate. We have autistic six-year-old twins, and we have the door set up so that they can't open it without us there. So to hear this sound, it could only be my wife. What was weird was the fact that she usually doesn't go outside without saying something to me. I walked out the front and saw my wife walking down our private road towards the drive on the side of our house. I asked her what she's doing and she says she was sitting on the back patio and kept hearing a baby crying out in the woods. I said, seriously, and you just decided to walk off into the woods and investigate? She then looks out to the woods and says, See? There it is again, and I can't hear anything, but what I did notice is that it was completely silent out again. I told her just like before, the chances of a baby being out in the woods outside of our house is slim, and that she needed to get back into the house. What if someone left the baby out there? She said. Well, if that were true, 
I would hear it too, I replied. Now at this point, I was really starting to worry about my wife's mental health. I actually asked her to see a psychiatrist, and she did. Now, looking back, I feel really bad about this, knowing what I do. The key to this moment was that my wife had just given birth to a baby girl a month before. A few days after this, we're out front on the porch. It's early evening and I just mowed the lawn this day, and our three-year-old son was riding around in his little car in front of the house. Now, he knows that he's not allowed outside of a certain area that we mapped off. He loves playing outside, but with the road being 50 feet from our front porch, we have to be careful as a lot of boaters will fly through after drinking all day on their boats. As we were talking, we're both keeping an eye on him. A neighbor drives by and stops to say hi for a second. This interaction took approximately eight seconds, as all they said were, How are things? Good, we replied. And he told us he would stop by later as his wife got something for the kids. We said, Okay, great. And he drove off. I looked over where our son was, and he was gone. I called out his name and ran over to the side of our house, and I could hear his car on our side drive. I scolded him for leaving the area, and he said something in his three-year-old gibberish and pointed to the woods behind our house. You have five seconds to get back to the front of the house, or else, I told him, and he adamantly pointed back in the direction of the woods and kept trying to tell me something. I looked off in the direction of the woods and just assumed he saw a deer or a squirrel or something and wanted to see it up close. I walked him back up to the front of the house and he cried the whole way there. He got really upset that I wouldn't let him go into the woods, but I just wrote this off as him being curious and most three-year-old boys are. Now this instance isn't isolated as our twins have done something similar but not quite as extreme as this. There have been nights where we had just laid down for the night and heard a loud bang on the side of our house on the wall behind our bed. It was so loud that I jumped up and looked out the window. Our floodlight had come on, but I could see nothing. Now the weird part about this is that our bedroom sits about 12 feet from the ground level as we have a full-size basement that's cinder block. I put on my slippers and grabbed one of my 12-gauge shotguns and walked outside to investigate. It was dead silent again. The floodlight that's on the side of the house had clicked off at this point, so I walked over to the end of the deck and shined my light around the yard. There was nothing. I walked around the house and shined the light around intently. As I approached the back side of my house, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt like something was watching me. I shined the light up in the trees, but again, nothing. I rounded the corner and the first thing I noticed was that my three dogs that were in their area weren't making a peep. Now our dogs have no filter and will bark at anyone and everyone. This includes me, so to see them all hiding with their tails between their legs, not making a peep, really had me worried. As I kept walking, all of a sudden the crickets and frogs started making sounds again. It was as if someone had clicked a switch. I walked back into the house and told my wife that I hadn't seen anything. She shrugged and said okay, as long as our dogs were okay. Due to the circumstances that night, I decided to let the dogs in and sleep with us. This very same thing has happened on all four exterior walls of our house. It's random and annoying, but just like this instance, every time there's nothing going on outside. There have also been times where we were sitting in the house, and as I was watching a movie, my wife walked over to me and said, Did you call me? I told her no, and she said she swears she heard me call her name in her ear. She said it was definitely my voice, but she didn't understand because it was so close and I was a good 20 feet away from her in my recliner. The important part of this was that she was sitting at the table doing something and the slider to the backyard was open behind her. Now, our patio sits about 20 feet off the ground and is like a balcony as it has no stair access outside. 
I think the previous owner built it for barbecuing. There have been several instances where she would say she heard someone whisper in her ear, but she couldn't make out the sound. Again, I kept thinking she was going crazy, but as you will see, I think all of this is tied into this final moment where things are revealed. The last thing I want to mention before we get into what just happened is that I have a shooting range built behind my workshop on the opposite side of our property, next to the main road. It's kind of on a downslope, but it works perfectly for what I need it for. The range itself cuts straight into the woods, going about a hundred yards or so. When you're at the downrange, you have woods surrounding you on all sides, except back up to my shop. I have to say, it has always felt creepy when I'm dealing with my targets or mowing. When you're down there, it feels like you're miles from anyone. One day, around five in the evening, I was sighting in a new rifle scope. The sun was still up, but was starting to fade soon, so I knew this was going to be the final test. Up until this point, nothing really happened while I was making my multiple trips downrange other than this feeling of uneasiness. As I got downrange, I kept feeling like someone or something was watching me. I looked around, but didn't see anything. As I was placing stickers over my previous shots, I heard something big off to the side of me. It sounded like a large branch had snapped off a tree. Now, if you've been in the Tennessee woods, you will know that a lot of branches fall off trees randomly out of nowhere, so this is nothing new. Except this time, it was very loud and sounded like fresh, strong wood, if that makes any sense. I turned and looked but again couldn't see anything. I started walking back up to my rifle, and I swear I heard someone right behind me. I turned around, but again saw nothing. As I started to walk, I heard this deep growl. It was really deep and loud, and what's worse is that it was all around me. I turned around, facing the range, and started walking backwards. The thought of some rabbit dog charging out of the bushes had me freaked out, so running wasn't a good idea. I slowly walked backwards up the hill to my rifle, but nothing happened. I grabbed my rifle and sprayed the target with rapid fire, hoping to scare off whatever was stalking me. I left ten rounds in the mag and grabbed my rifle back and quickly walked back up to the house. I never told my wife about this as I didn't want her to freak out. Fast forward about a year later from when we moved in, and my niece is staying with us as a live-in nanny to earn money over summer break from college. We were on our way back from the store, and about a mile from our house, I saw two eyes reflecting the headlights coming from a wide tree on the side of the road just ahead. It had caught my attention because they were higher than a deer, but also a different color and size. Just as I had said, what is that? and squinted. They vanished. I made a comment that it was almost as if it had known I could see its eyes, and it moved. The color was kind of golden and green, but they resembled the mannerisms of a large cat as they felt ominous. It's hard to explain, but I shrugged it off as we were passing the tree and saw nothing. A few moments later, we arrived at the house. As we're getting bags out of the car, my three-year-old came bolting out of the house, excited to see me. As I was waiting to help her carry in her bags, I heard my dog growl. I looked in the direction. She was looking at my neighbor's property across the street. Now, what I saw kept me up all night. Up until this point, I've always been skeptical as I've never seen anything with my own two eyes. Even with what had happened to me the year prior, I still had my doubts that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Now my street is kind of a spread out neighborhood. Each house sits on several acres, and at the end of our road is Kentucky Lake. My neighbor's house sits adjacent to my house on about an acre lot. Directly in front of my house is a wall of woods, and directly behind my house is several thousand acres of untouched forest. As I was looking across the street to my neighbor's property, 
I saw a large dark figure between the trees at first. The movement caught me off guard as it looked like something big moved quickly on all fours. Then, when it came out into clear view, it stood up and walked like a man. At first, I didn't know what to make of it. It was very tall, but what was strange about it was the distance it was covering and the fact that when it was in front of his shed, I swear I could see through it. It was clearly walking quickly, but moving faster than any person could at a sprint. More importantly, there was no sound. It was like it was phasing in and out of reality as it moved. I said, what the hell is that? And realized that it was looking directly at us. It had moved at an angle away from us to minimize its time out in the open, and moving as quickly as it could while still being silent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I realized that whatever it was, was stalking us. I told my niece to get in the house now and I grabbed my son and booked it inside. I grabbed my AR-15 with a short scope and came back outside to see my niece still grabbing stuff out of her car. Knowing I told her firmly and clearly to get in the house, her disregard to my command annoyed me, but still I watched over her without saying a word. As she was slowly walking, she turned towards the woods across the street from my house and suddenly bolted for the house. She ran up the steps in a panicked state. I asked her what she saw, and her face was pale as a ghost. She said, I heard something big in the woods walking loudly on the leaves, and when I turned toward it, I heard a deep, guttural growl. I asked her why she didn't come when I told her, and she said she thought I was talking to my son. I told her what I'd seen and she wanted to get a closer look to see if she could see something. I told her that it was not a good idea, and she went anyway. As she was walking down the walkway, I heard the sound of dry leaves crunching in the woods across the street. I told her to stop and come take the flashlight. Now at this point, she's about six foot away from my wife's SUV. As she turned and started walking back to me, I caught a glimpse of something gray and hairy bolt from behind the SUV back across the street into the woods. My porch is a raised porch, and our SUV is about 6 foot 5 tall, and whatever this was cleared it about 45 feet in what looked like a single jump. It moved like lightning. Whatever it was, it wanted my niece. It jumped behind the car out of my line of sight and was waiting for her. She still doubted my warnings and grabbed the flashlight and walked back toward the car. As she entered my driveway, she stopped dead in her tracks and leaned forward as if she could see something. I asked her what she saw. She turned and ran back up on the porch with a terrified look on her face, saying, nope, over and over again. She said it was a figure hiding inside of a tree and that she saw its eyes. I asked her what they looked like, and all she could say was that they looked dull red at first, but as she got closer, they looked dead. I said, what do you mean dead? And she said that the pupils looked gray, kind of like the way eyes look when they go blind. She said it was really dark gray, and she swears she could see through it almost like a dark cloud. She wanted to go out again and took a step down the stairs, and as she did, it revealed itself from the tree. I said, get inside, and I went in and locked the door. It looked like a tall human-shaped being. It was really tall and looked ominous as hell. The next morning, we did a height comparison to the tree limb we saw it stand over, and we put its height to around 9 feet tall, and its eyes were about 6 inches apart. At this point, I don't know what this thing was. After doing some research, I think this thing was a glimmer man or crawler. I looked to see if there had been any other sightings in Benton County, but nothing. More importantly, I swear it would phase in and out, almost like a shadow person, but bigger and more obvious. One of the things that makes this fit is that it can communicate telepathically. 
This explains why everyone was hearing something that nobody else could hear. Secondly, it has a playback-like communication, so when I heard a dog panting, it was probably one of my dogs it had heard. My wife was actually hearing our son crying for help, as he had recently fell and cried for help. The baby crying would be our newborn baby, who she would given birth to recently, and it must have heard me calling my wife's name and kept telepathically calling my wife's name with my voice. Another thing is that my niece had said that night was the night she felt compelled to go back outside. She said she'd felt this thing was communicating with her somehow, and it wanted her to go back outside. The more I read about this thing, the more everything that's been happening over the past year makes sense. One thing that I find extra convincing is that down the roads towards the lake, there's a property that's cordoned off with barbed wire, and there's a wall of forest with no driveway. A lot of the property down our road is underdeveloped owned land, and on one of the trees, there's this large old sign that says, Screamer lives here, with an arrow pointing back into the woods. Now I have to admit, when I first saw the sign, I laughed, thinking maybe the owner screamed at trespassers who entered his property, and teenagers put up the sign to mess with him. But when I did a satellite search of our neighborhood, that entire section of road has no houses or trails or anything. It's just pure forest for as far as the eye can see. One of the things that this thing is said to do is make a loud scream when threatened. Now that you understand my story, I doubt this is the ending. The next question is what can we do? I don't want my wife or kids to disappear one day, and if there's more than one of these sightings out there, this really makes the missing 411 make a whole lot of sense. I feel perplexed and scared as to what I can do. I wanted to update. Thank you all for the support. Unfortunately, we can't afford to get a camera system or trail cameras that many have recommended. I'm a disabled veteran, and I just lost my business due to the lockdowns. We're struggling to afford the basic amenities currently. One night when my niece arrived, we went out on the front porch to welcome her. I did notice something that looked like a face staring at me, but what was weird was that as I was staring at it, it moved back into the shadow without moving if that makes any sense. The one thing that I would like to add in this update that I hadn't thought was connected was about two to three weeks ago, my wife and I had been in an argument about something silly. She decided to walk into our woods to clear her head. I was on the back patio when I noticed her walking down our shooting range. I asked her where she was going, and she said, to cool off. Now, I knew the chances of something happening to her were slim, but I found it odd that she chose to go into the woods rather than simply walking down the road. I quickly got dressed and went to go down to try and bring her back. I went to the end of the range and called her name. After a few minutes of calling out, I heard nothing. Not a peep or a twig or anything. Now the weird part is that it is impossible to move around in these woods without making any sound, especially for her. I was worried that she was walking too far, but I had to get back into the house as our children were alone. It freaked me out because it was as if she had vanished. I went back into the house and debated calling someone, but I figured I would give her a bit more time. I went to the back patio and waited. After about an hour, I started to get really worried. I called out her name again and decided that I would call if she hadn't returned at the hour and a half mark. After another 20 minutes went by, she came walking back out of the woods. Angry that she'd worried me so much, yet also relieved, I asked her what she was thinking. She said, what, as she walked back up into the house. She came in and looked at me like I was crazy. I said, did you not hear me calling out to you? She said she only heard me once, and she replied, and this is where it gets crazy. She said, I've only been gone for 10 to 15 minutes. Why are you freaking out? When I told her that she'd been gone for an hour and 20 minutes, she didn't believe me. 
She also said that when she went down there, she didn't go very far. But when she turned around, she started walking and got worried that she was lost. She said she didn't recognize where she was, but something told her to keep walking. She said it felt strange and that the air felt different. When she came back out of the woods, she was relieved to see the house. Now, the part that upsets me the most about this was that where she said she was was impossible. I was literally standing 20 to 30 feet away from that spot. If she had been there, not only would I have seen her, but she could have talked to me in a normal voice. My concern is that you can see the house from this spot, and how she felt lost is mind-boggling. I don't know what this was. I thought that again she was just losing her mind. I plan to go back where she was with her to prove that you can see the house from there, but I want her to show me exactly where all she went, as well as talk me through everything. An update on June 24th, 2022. Weird things kept happening. My three-year-old son was playing on the back patio a few feet away from us, and all of a sudden, the dogs inside jump and start barking as one of our dogs, Duke, that's on the patio with him, comes bolting into the door. I jump up to see what's going on, and my son's pointing at the tree line, saying, Werewolf, Daddy, werewolf. Now my son loves watching videos of werewolves for toddlers for some reason. I would normally put this off as nothing, but if you saw the look on his face, you would know that he was serious. Plus, with the way my dogs reacted, he had to have seen something. I pulled out my phone and began recording. He kept saying, Daddy, look, werewolf in the bushes. I tell him I can't see anything, but I can hear something really big in the leaves. An update on September 7th, 2022. My niece quit. She said she couldn't handle all the stuff that's been happening to her. Everything was fine for a while. We kept indoors for the most part. We went out on the porch one night with a flashlight and camera, hoping to catch something. We kept hearing things in the brush, which could be anything. After a while of not seeing anything, we went back inside. I said my prayers and then slept like a baby. My niece, however, did not. She woke up late the next day and seemed a bit jumpy. I asked her what's wrong. She said that she didn't sleep well as something was outside her window. It took a bit of prodding to get her to talk about it. She said she could hear something big outside her window. But every time she looked, she couldn't see anything. She said she heard weird noises that she couldn't describe. She came out to the living room to see if I was still up, but I was fast asleep. She decided to go back to her room and go to sleep watching YouTube on her phone. She said she was almost asleep when she felt something standing right behind her. She turned around and there was nothing. She said she kept having that feeling, but brushed it off as her imagination. That was until about 3 a.m. when she woke up. She said she had her phone on the windowsill playing a video. She had the same feeling as before, but this time it was very intense. Like whatever it was, it wanted to devour her. She turned around quickly and saw what looked like a shadow disappear into the wall in the blink of an eye. She told me this kept happening until she passed out late in the morning. I told her that it was weird as we've never experienced anything like that in the house before. We have had weird things happen, like things disappear for a while, then reappear days or months later in the exact spot they last were. She said it felt like whatever this was, it made her feel like it wanted to hurt her. I told her to keep me updated and let me know if anything else happens. A few days later, she asks if she can use the hot tub that's out back. I explain that it's off and we can't afford to heat it. When we go over to it, I open it to look inside. To my disbelief, not only is it on, but the water looks great, minus a little cleanup that needed to be done. As I'm walking around, all of a sudden, I hear this really loud thump behind me, like a log falling onto the ground or a really big boulder hitting the ground. 
Imagine an engine block falling 20 feet onto soft soil. It made me jump. I turned around but couldn't see anything as the brush was too thick. I helped her work on the spa. Then she says she's going to go inside and get changed so she can get in. I look around and realize that it's getting dark outside and I really don't want to be out here. I bend over to work on getting the filter cleaned out and I hear what sounds like something big snapping branches and charging at me. It made me jump, then run to the back door. I turned around to see what it was, and nothing. I walk back into the house and walk up the stairs. I tell her I heard something out there, and she looked at me for a minute, then said, Well, I want to get in and relax. She asks if I can leave the back patio door open, so if she needs me, she can call. But according to her, she enjoyed the spa without incident. Every day I notice her getting more anxious and less willing to talk about it. She says every night something new happens to her, but when I ask her to elaborate, she would refuse. A few nights later, I walk out on the porch and notice it's dead quiet again. I ask her to come out on the porch with me, but she says she's tired and wants to call her boyfriend and go to bed. My wife gets up early and takes care of the kids, and it's my job to handle the night shift so she's in bed at this point. I decide I don't have the guts to do this alone, so I put on a movie and relax in my recliner. I end up falling asleep, then wake up at 3am to a noise coming from my niece's room. It sounds like a deep voice, and I knock on the door. I call out several times, but get nothing in response. I figure it must be her video and decide to let it be. I head to bed, and just as I start to pass out, another loud bang happens. I wake up to hear what sounds like something skittering on the wall outside of my bedroom. Understand that this is way up in the air and physically impossible. I look out the window but don't see anything. After going out and checking on this bang multiple times over the last year and seeing nothing, I decide to forget it and go back to sleep. The next day my niece comes out and tells me that she had the shadow thing happen again, except this time she left her light on. She said she woke up to getting that feeling again. She said that when she opened her eyes, she could see an extremely tall, shadowy figure standing over the top of her. She said it was moving closer to her, and just as she started to see the details of its face, she turned around in panic, but nothing was there. She said the eyes haunted her, but didn't want to elaborate any further. The next morning, for the first time ever, my niece is up bright and early. I noticed she looked anxious as she told me that she's headed home for the 4th of July weekend and will be back on Tuesday. I ask her if she's okay, and she says yes, and quickly walks out the door. Later that day, I get a call from my sister, telling me that she won't be coming back. I ask her if everything's alright, and she says yes, that she just wants to enjoy the rest of her summer. A little while later, I get a call from my niece telling me that she doesn't want to work here anymore, as she can't handle the anxiety from whatever is out there. She doesn't elaborate more than that, but whatever has been going on in her room has her petrified. I checked on her room and noticed that she's been sleeping with one of the windows wide open. The window is perfectly accessible from the outside. I don't know what's been going on, but whatever it is, looks like it could have been coming into the room. Fast forward to the 4th of July. I do fireworks out front of the property by the road facing the woods. Due to what's been happening at night, I decided to do them prior to it getting dark outside. We do our fireworks, and just as it starts getting dark, I get everyone inside. After a couple of hours, I remember that my hose is still on the ground and laying out by the road. I head out to clean everything up and put the hose away. While I'm doing this, I notice it's dead silent again, minus the sound of the fireworks in the distance. The hairs on the back of my neck go up and I get the feeling that I'm being watched again. I hurry and coil the hose and ran back into the house. I swear, 
I'm starting to wonder if it's just my mind playing tricks on me at this point. My two buddies and I went on a hunting trip for bull elk last November, and we were having a great time to say the least. That, however, would soon change after what we saw on the third day. Now, I'm not one for superstition, and I don't believe in ghosts at all, but what we saw out there really changed my view about those sort of things. The trip started out normally after we parked our trailers at camp. We got there a day early before the hunt officially started so we could settle in and get some scouting done. Only Eric and I had licenses because Brian didn't draw out this year, but he wanted to come along with us anyway. Brian also brought along his German Shepherd named Lucy, which stayed back at camp with a leash that was connected to a metal spike. The spike was so deep in the ground that I wondered if we would be able to get it out. I asked Brian and he just told me that his dog was so strong that it had to be that deep. I enjoyed playing with Lucy. She was always excited to see me and would greet me by jumping up on two legs and trying to lick my face. Eric, however, was not amused by her and would constantly yell at her to leave him alone. Anyway, the first two days we saw so many cow elk in the valleys and on the sides of the mountains that I thought for sure we would see some bulls out there but there were none among them. It wasn't until the third day of the hunt that we saw a bull elk, but it was too far away to take a shot at. And even if we were able to hit it, it would take hours trying to pack that thing out. So that evening, we decided to hunker down next to some fallen trees and were able to watch a hillside. While we were surveying the area, Brian spotted a coyote about 250 yards walking to a small pond of water strangely as if it was maimed. Eric took out his binoculars to take a closer look and he started to describe it saying, that coyote, it ain't looking right. It has a hunch on its back like a bear and its jaw, oh man, its damn jaw seems like it's been broken and now it's just drooping there like a dead fish. Let me see those binos. I asked curiously with an outstretched hand. Eric handed them to me, and as he did, he seemed to grasp his gun tightly. I took them and looked at the animal and said, You're right, that thing's jaw is just hanging there. Also, did you happen to notice its hair? It's so long and unevenly dispersed. I then handed the binoculars to Brian, and he looked at the coyote for one second and screamed. Shh, Brian, shut up, we're hunting, Eric whispered harshly. What did you see? I asked as I looked at his shocked facial expression. Brian looked at his feet as he muttered. I, I, I saw my dog Lucy, but it wasn't her. I, I don't know what that was. It couldn't have been your dog. When I looked at it, it looked like a dying coyote. It didn't have the large black spot on its back or your dog's strawberry red sides and underbelly, I said in a plain yet confused manner. Well, since we ain't gonna see anything out here cause you screamed like a baby, I'm gonna put that coyote out of its misery, Eric said angrily as he raised his rifle and looked through the scope. A large shot followed and we saw the animal drop down soon after. It was a clean kill and Eric was curious about seeing what was wrong with the animal up close, so he started getting ready to hike out. As he got his stuff together, he said, You probably just didn't get a good look at it, Brian. Your dog is fine. Brian stood up, and as he brushed the dirt off of his ass, he replied, I swear I saw my dog, but an evil demented version of it with human eyes. But you guys are probably right. There's no way she could have had the strength to yank out the metal stake holding her back at camp. Well, let's go find out the truth about this animal, I said somewhat excitedly as I started walking towards the dead animal. It took us about half an hour to hike over to it and we lost sight of the animal's corpse as we had to pass through some trees. Once we finally got to the spot where the animal had dropped, 
There was no corpse, just a puddle of blood. However, the blood was blackish and very dense. Eric observed the scene and started to scratch his head as he said, I could have sworn I shot that thing straight through its heart. There's no way it could have just gotten back up and walked off. I had an eerie feeling about the whole situation, and Brian was still afraid that it might have been his dog that got shot. Eric, however, noticed a trail of blood leading into a dark tree line. Without asking, he started to follow it and he loaded his gun. As he did, me and Brian were both freaked out and just watched Eric as he went into the forest. He soon went out of sight, and Brian and I couldn't leave him there, so we waited. I passed the time by taking a skinny stick and poking at the puddle of blood. It smelled terrible, and the aroma hit me pretty hard, so much so that my stomach convulsed and I threw up. You okay? Brian asked as he put his hand on my back. Before I could answer, there was a loud shot that echoed through the trees, and we both looked at the direction it came from. Must have found the animal, I said as I spit into the grass. As soon as I said this, we could now see Eric, but he was full on sprinting. Run, he screamed as he ran at us. I noticed that he must have dropped his gun because he wasn't carrying it. I was about to ask him what happened, but Brian grabbed my arm and yanked me towards where we had parked the truck. Without hesitation, I ran. We soon made it back to the truck, and my shoulder hurt from the rubbing of the gun strap. I looked back at Eric, who slowed down for nothing. I soon looked behind him and saw nothing chasing us, so I opened the truck and got in without worry. Eric then climbed in and told me to hit the gas and go. I was so perplexed on what Eric saw out there, and I knew that he hardly ever got scared of anything, so this started to freak me out. I started driving fast back to camp, and I asked Eric, what did you see out there that was scary enough to make you drop your gun? I don't know, man. That was no damn animal. I followed the trail of blood, and it stopped at the base of a tree, and I was wondering how a coyote was able to climb a tree, but when I looked up, I saw this hairy humanoid creature there. It smelled so bad. Eric went on about how scary that thing was and how he was done with the hunting trip and wanted to go home. We soon pulled into camp and mutually decided that we were going home. I started to pack my things and then felt like something was missing. I then thought to myself, Lucy, where's Brian's dog? She usually always is so excited to see us back at camp. She can't stop barking and whining to be set free. As soon as I thought this, Brian started screaming and crying. I ran over to where he was and saw that his dog was gone. However, on further inspection, I noticed what Brian was looking at. Something had pulled out the metal stake in the ground and strung Lucy up on a nearby tree and it skinned her. Brian just could not stop crying, and Eric ran over to see what was wrong, and just stood there, jaw dropped and frozen. He then muttered, she was skinned alive. There's a bunch of bruising caused by strangling around her neck where the collar is. Shut up, Eric. You ain't helping, I said as I put my shoulder around Brian, who had unstrung his dog's body from the tree. Skinwalker. Eric said in a low tone of voice as he looked into the distance. He then screamed, It's a damn skinwalker. I followed his gaze and saw an animal that looked like Lucy, but it had human eyes and a sickly green glazed looking coat of fur. Brian stopped crying and just stood there, eyes locked on the beast. Eric then whispered with his voice quivering, We all run to the truck on the count of three just leave everything else. Brian and I slowly nodded and agreed to the plan. Okay, three, two, one. Eric whispered sharply and we all took off like a pack of gazelles for the truck. We hopped in and as soon as we did, we saw the skinwalker lunge at us and struck the right side door with such a powerful blow 
that it nearly tipped over the whole truck. It did not stop me whatsoever, and I drove out of there faster than I ever could have. After that, none of us ever went hunting again in that area. We never even went back to claim our camping trailers and supplies. It was too terrifying to think that what happened to Brian's dog could happen to us, and that thing would walk around in our skin. Since that experience, I am now a superstitious person. I was wondering if anyone else has also had any experiences with people that didn't quite seem to be people, like there was something off about them. I had an experience some time ago that I could never shake off. So this happened in Charleston, South Carolina around Christmas of 2017. I used to work at a popular coffee shop that was inside of a popular big box retail store. One day around Christmas time, I had two guests that struck me as odd immediately. They were pale Caucasian women, probably mid-twenties, that both looked nearly identical, but one was about a head taller. They had the exact same haircut, very straight, platinum blonde bowl-like cuts. Their faces were quite round, and their eyes were a noticeably bright hazel color and appeared quite large, but not in like a disproportionate gray alien kind of way. They both also had a fairly odd stiff gait, as though they had a board strapped to their back. They sort of shuffled their feet around when they walked. They both also had oversized sweaters, and I noticed later the shorter one had theirs on backwards. The weird part was their behavior. When they first walked in, the shorter one looked around the store as if they'd never been in one. Her overall demeanor was somewhat childlike, like a good customer service rep. I welcomed them in and told them to ask if they had any questions. The short girl looked at the taller one as if for approval. She then slowly nodded her head towards me, mouth slightly agape, and then attempted a hand wave. Instead of waving it at the wrist like most people, she waves with her forearm, palm flat and straight in a sort of robotic windshield wiper motion. She then turns to the taller one who gives her an encouraging nod. They then proceed to walk around the cafe looking at the cups and merchandise. The short girl would often point all around the store and seem to be asking the taller one questions, almost as if this was a guided tour of sorts. Now, obviously I'm no linguist, but my city is a fairly popular tourist destination and I've met foreigners from all over the globe. Even if I don't recognize a specific language, I can usually estimate around about where it may be from. Whether it's Germanic, Slavic, Asiatic, Middle Eastern, or whatnot in origin, but the language they spoke to each other was very strange and not like one I've ever heard. Imagine if you mixed Simish with baby babble and sped it up. Lots of guh, blah, and ooh sounds. They continued on checking out the merchandise and going on what seemed to be a Q&A session. They would often open up cups and look inside grab bags of beans and squeeze and shake them. At one point, the shorter one took apart a French press, and the taller one seemed to be trying to explain what it was for. This went on for about another ten minutes or so, when the short one picked out a studded cup to purchase. She shuffles her way to the counter and places the cup down, frequently looking towards her friend as if looking for reassurance, who again does a simple nod in encouragement. She then looks towards me and attempts to smile, which was just bearing her perfectly straight white top teeth as though she were biting her bottom lip and slowly nodding, not saying a word. It was here I noticed her sweater was on backwards, the tag sticking out in front of her neck. Now that I have a good look, I will say she was quite oddly attractive, but there was something about her appearance that gave me uncanny valley vibes but I couldn't tell you what exactly was off. I will say I don't recall them ever blinking. I scanned the cup and went on the typical checkout spiel, to which there was no reply. When it was time to pay, she pulled out a silver credit card that had no markings whatsoever. 
No logos, no numbers, no name. Just blank plastic with a chip. She then looks back over to the taller one and says something, who then comes over and finishes the transaction for her, showing her as though it was a teaching moment. I hand her the cup and she once again slowly nods her head, mouth ajar, and does her windshield wiper wave. They then shuffle their way out of the cafe and into the rest of the store, and I never saw them again. I've told this story to people before, and they usually hand wave it and say they were probably just tourists from Europe, or maybe they had a condition of sorts. But like I've said, I've encountered many foreigners, and none of them acted this much like a fish out of water, nor was their overall demeanor and behavior this uncanny. I won't rule it out as a possibility, of course, but it doesn't quite fit satisfactory for me. It was just too weird. I don't know. What do you guys think? Have any of you experienced anything similar? This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always like camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out a trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning. I hike about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking or dragging noise. I felt so bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by, and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after like this deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the fuck? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple other different directions, all different, and confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air, in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. 
not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line. I saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent, alert. I grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, Hey, who's there? Their voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way but I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. Most of my money comes from babysitting, there was a pair of loving parents whose one-year-old I would watch every week. One day, there was a knock at the door. The mother told me that the landlady was coming by to pick something up, so I assumed that it was her. I opened the door to a raggedy man in a stained white tank top. The moment I saw him, I froze with just the door open a crack. He asked me if the dad of the kid I was babysitting was home. It was clear he was up to no good, so... I lied and said that it was only me and my older brother. The guy then stepped uncomfortably close to the door and asked if he could come inside to check. I was alone with a one-year-old. I said that it wasn't my house and I couldn't let him in, but I could take a message for the parents. He told me to tell them. Guilty wanted them. I uncomfortably smiled and shut the door. I immediately called the kid's parents as I ran around the house. Locking the doors and windows, I watched the guy take a picture of the house and leave. My uncle, whom I trust, showed up in two minutes with a weapon to protect me and the baby after hearing what happened. Police were called to patrol the area. When the parents got home, they told me the guy had some issues with them and came looking to fight the dad. That's the scariest job I've done. So my fiancé and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-month-old kitten that we already have. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist, so I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two hours and 30 minutes away from our home. I inquired about it at around 10.30pm. I know it was late, but almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived so that she would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. At the time, I thought nothing of it, so I sent them a video. We set up a time for the next day to meet. The next day came. I wasn't going to take my fiancé, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to be my protection in case, since Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove two hours and thirty minutes. As we were on our way, I was texting this girl that we would get there on time, and she responded, Great, see you then. We arrived at the home. 
Me in the driver's seat and my fiancé in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and I got no response. I called and no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and knocked on the door. Nothing. There was a car in the driveway, but no response from the number or the door. We got there at 6.30 and waited until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I said I'm here since I inquired about a kitten and she said, A kitten? I said, Yes, it was an ad on Craigslist. No one has kittens in this house though, she said. I showed her the ad and she said, Oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. Well, on their ad, they said they have to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets, I said. That's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door over, the neighbor said. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbor was also in on something since it was too creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiancé. Literally immediately when we pulled out on the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just now getting your messages. Something must be wrong with my phone. Do you still want the kitten or no? I didn't answer and we headed back home. What I don't understand is, they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up, not knowing I'd be with my fiancé. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? Hi everyone, I spent all night reading through Let's Not Meet yesterday. Some of these stories are truly bizarre. It inspired me to write about an incident that normally I hate to even talk about because it's honestly one of the most disturbing things that I've ever experienced. This all started in January 2019, so it's pretty recent. For some background, I'm a young gay man living in a very populated city, so weird things are bound to happen, especially when using the gay dating app Grindr. I'm sure you've all heard of it. When this started, I was living in a biggish city in northern Florida, but had plans to move the next week. My two friends had come down to celebrate my moving away and also one of their birthdays. We hung out in my city for a day and then drove to Miami together. It was a lot of fun for the most part, but this story begins on the last day of my vacationing there. We were at a brunch place preparing to say goodbye to the city and drive back home so I could pack my things and relocate to where I live now and I receive a notification from Grindr saying that I had received a new message. I opened it up and the message simply said, Hi, or something of the sort. It was from a blank profile, and it said it was using a feature called Explore, meaning this person wasn't local to Miami, but lived elsewhere. I replied, not minding the faceless profile, because a lot of men on that app are not open with their sexuality, and might not want to take a risk of people in their actual life finding out about them. We make small talk, exchange names and such. He seemed like a really nice person. He eventually sent me a few pictures of him, and he was very attractive looking. He asked me for my number, and I was so flustered by Miami and saying goodbye to our temporary friends that I just gave it to him without thinking about what could come of it. I regret this dearly. We texted over the next few days, and things seemed pretty normal. We talked a lot, just casual chit-chat, asking about our careers, goals, and whatnot. Nothing strange. And then I noticed a notification from the Cash App that I received $100 from a random username that I didn't recognize. The memo was an eggplant emoji. I was so confused and started texting my friends telling them how a random person had just accidentally sent me a hundred dollars and how he'd have to keep sending me more in order to ask me to return it because you can only communicate with someone on the app if it includes a payment. We got a laugh out of this and I decided to just return the money because I would be really upset 
If I was on the other end of the equation, and I had just graciously donated that amount of money to a random person. Before I was able to do that, though, my new grinder friend texted me and said, Don't ask me for any more. That's all I can give you. I will block you if you ask me to send you more. I was so confused. I never asked this man for money. I have no idea how he even got my Cash App username. I know you can look for people using their phone numbers, but I hadn't even linked my new phone number to that app yet. I replied, asking him how he got my information, but he wouldn't say anything about it. I guess I just dropped it because... free money. And I'm an idiot for that. Time goes on, and things are getting a little weird between our texts. He begins asking me to send him pictures of my feet, which in itself isn't weird, but something just felt very off about him at this point. It was as if I was talking to a new person. I tell him that he needs to calm down a bit and that this was getting uncomfortable for me, to which he agrees. Time goes by and eventually he insinuates that I should move back to Florida, to the city where he was located, so that he could take care of me. I firmly decline, to which he says, well then, I will come to you. At this point, my alarm bells are going off and I'm thinking, I've got to put an end to this. I don't reply right away, and he tells me that he's always wanted to come to my new city, the city I just moved to. How the hell do you know where I live? I didn't give him any of my social media, and even if I had, there's no way he could have known, because I intentionally withheld any information online about me relocating, as I was tired of everyone knowing my business. I've always had my location on Grindr set to off, so he couldn't see where I was or even how many miles away I was from him. I told him that at this point, he needs to leave me alone and that I didn't wish to talk to him. I didn't block him though because I was starting to get paranoid and wanted to have a record of things he would continue to say in case shit got super weird, which of course it did. First, he told me he was sorry for lying and sent me a few more pictures of what is actually him. I hate to sound like a jerk, but something was seriously off with the way this person looked. Almost every picture, he had a very big, disturbing, ecstatic smile and big, wide eyes staring directly into the camera, very close up. He was probably in his thirties and looked like he didn't take care of himself very well. His skin was uneven and gray, and he had a short beard that looks like it hadn't had maintenance at all, if that makes any sense. One of them looks like it might have been an accident, because his face was blurry, and he was angrily just staring into the camera with a hateful, evil expression on his face. He also sent me one of his mouth, but only his big smile pictured. Nothing else was in it. There were pictures of his apartment as well and it looked almost empty other than a small table with a photograph of unknown people in it. Also, a fire hydrant was there. It was all very weird. I didn't reply to these, and that resulted in a string of angry texts from him, telling me he wished he'd never met me and that he hates me. Throughout all of the weird, uncomfortable, and filthy texts he sent me, there are few exceptionally disturbing things. He sent me a link to his YouTube page, which I did end up viewing, and the videos were literally just him talking to himself and making jokes to himself. There were 10 plus of them, and I was the first viewer, although they'd been up for months. If that wasn't weird enough, whenever he would pause in between sentences in these videos, I would hear faintly in the background what sounded like someone's muffled screaming, and every so often after hearing the screaming, I would hear him try to hold back a very high-pitched, sinister laughter that sounded nothing like him. I could tell from the sound quality that it was something this man was producing and not a bystander. Most of these videos have since been deleted, and I don't know why. I write poetry, and at some point he was begging me to send him my poetry. He also sent me a link to his WordPress, which I also viewed and the poems were somehow actually very well written, like extremely beautiful poems, but I realized that the things he was saying in them made absolutely no sense. 
and I tried analyzing them any way I could because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this guy, and none of them made sense. He would randomly send me small amounts of money on the app, I guess in an attempt to get me to talk to him. Fast forward a bit, and I was still receiving a message from him every 10 minutes that I wasn't replying to. These were weird. Here are what some of them said. Did you fucking block me, you little bitch? You want to put me out of your life, little bitch, that's fine, but it's an irreversible decision. When you push me out of your life, you don't get me back in. When you feel dumb about it later, and you will. I'm the best thing that's happened to you in years. It's a privilege to know me. You want to clear a space out for someone more deserving because you're an uppity little bitch. Not a problem. You're not getting rid of me. Stuff like that. I withheld some of the more vile and descriptive ones depicting what he would do to me sexually because I don't like to read them or think about them. He would also reply to his own texts almost instantly and apologize for what he said and told me, please don't go, and things like that. I finally broke down and told one of my best friends about this, who was also gay but very muscular and protective of me. I don't know. He just makes me feel safe somehow, and I don't know how else to say it. He immediately got really mad and took my phone and called him. My best friend told him aggressively that he was my boyfriend, and that the creepy guy needed to stop reaching out. The grinder guy is silent, and then suddenly starts hysterically laughing and making the most inhumane, god-awful noises I'd ever heard. Speaking sentences that were English, but with words that didn't make any sense together at all, and just really creeped us out. The look on my friend's face still gives me chills. He never gets uncomfortable, but he was just staring at me with this blank expression, and it was in this moment that I realized that I should have just blocked this man as soon as I realized something was off. I didn't know what to do, I guess. After the call, he texts me a lot of horrible things, and then says sorry, and this is a cycle for about 15 minutes, until he sends me this. The private Facebook message you may see were all written before our conversation via text and phone tonight, so naturally, disregard them. And Jonathan, fuck you. I just blocked him. I had no idea what he was on about with the Facebook thing. I looked and couldn't find anything. This final exchange happened about a month and a half ago. I thought this was the end until about two weeks ago. I was exploring a nearby large city with that same best friend. We were walking out of a museum and I see someone that looked very familiar leaning against a cement wall to the left of the big stairs that was the entry to the museum. He was staring at us, but I couldn't make anything out of it. I ignored it and we hopped on the bus to take us to a nearby restaurant for lunch. It wasn't until we got to the restaurant that I realized who this man was. It was him, the creepy grinder guy. I was sure of it. I have no idea how he knew where I was, but I knew he traveled over a thousand miles to come to the area I was living in. I didn't mention it to my friend because I'm seriously creeped out but I think I'm going to tell him when we hang out again because I don't want anything to happen to him either. Luckily, I'm moving again in a few weeks. This time, very, very far away. I'm considering taking this all to the police, but I don't know if I really have options. This has been the weirdest, most uncomfortable experience of my life. So, creepy grinder guy, let's never meet again. Seriously. This happened over 10 years ago, so excuse me if the details are a bit fuzzy. When I was in high school, my friend Claire came to sleep over. We made some plans to sneak out and hang out with some guys, and then one of them would drive us home. We go out to our friend's apartment, have some fun, and around midnight we decide it's time for us to head back. But when we ask to be taken back, 
Everyone says no, despite previously agreeing to bring us back. Everyone said they were too drunk or too high. So we eventually decide to just start walking back and we would make some phone calls to see if anyone could pick us up and bring us the rest of the way back. My house was a good 20 minutes away by car on the highway, so there was no way we were walking all the way back. The apartment was towards the back of the complex, so we start making our way to the entrance. We don't even get halfway there before a car starts rolling up behind us. I was 15 or 16 at the time, and very naive to the ways of the world, so I wasn't too concerned. But Claire was a little smarter than me on this night. She tells me to start walking faster, so we start walking faster. The car also picks up their pace behind us. Again, she tells me to walk faster, so we start moving as fast as we can, and that's when the car pulled slightly in front of us, and two of the passenger doors open, and two men get out. Realizing there's no walking faster to get out of this situation, she instructs me to run now, so she takes off running and I follow her. She runs towards a group of parked cars and jumps behind a pickup truck, and for a minute, we hope and pray that we weren't spotted. This is where details get a bit fuzzy. One of them must have gotten back in the car at some point, as there's only one of them following us behind the truck. We hear a set of footsteps quickly approaching, and she quietly indicates that we're now going into stealth mode. This man is on the other side of the truck that we're hiding behind. He's circling the truck looking for us and we're slowly and quietly circling it on the opposite side to avoid being spotted. It felt like a scene from a movie or video game. We somehow managed to do two or three circles around the vehicle without being detected, and by the grace of the gods, he gives up and decides to go back to the car with his friends. This is our one shot to get away. She tells me to run again, so we run for what felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only 15 to 20 seconds. We find the pool house area and find a spot to hide. We were hidden behind some fences and bushes and were anxiously waiting to see if they discover us. Their car pulls around to the pool house and we're biting our nails, hoping they don't spot and get out. The car slowly drives away and we realize we haven't been spotted. We were safe for now. But the car circled around the apartment complex for hours and hours and hours. They weren't giving up on looking for us. We were safe for the time being, but now we needed to find a way out of there. It was the middle of winter, and of course, we were dressed to impress the guys we went to hang out with. So short shorts and revealing tops. We were freezing. We found a dirty, disgusting Captain America blanket that we huddled under while making phone calls to find someone to pick us up. We tried contacting the guys at the apartment, but no one answered our calls. None of our friends answered our calls. We felt completely alone and hopeless, but around 5am someone finally answered and said they would pick us up. The best news I'd ever heard in my life. Our friend gets to the apartment complex but can't find the pool house. The group of men are still constantly circling around, so there's no way we're coming out of hiding. We manage to figure out where our friend is at with a little detective work, figuring out what building they're facing, what's in front of them, are there any dumpsters nearby, that kind of thing. We figure out where they're at so we make a run for it. We spot their car and hop in as fast as we can. Go, 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 we tell them, and our friend speeds off towards the entrance. We pass the group of men on the way out, and that was the last we saw of them. We made it back at around 6am, just in time to sneak back in without my parents ever knowing we even left. If Claire hadn't been with me that night, I definitely would have been abducted assaulted, and possibly killed. I'm so thankful for Claire and our friend that picked us up, but a big fuck you to the adult men we went to hang out with as teenagers, and especially fuck you to the guys that intended to harm us. On a happier note, 
I am now very vigilant and aware of my surroundings, and we washed the dirty Captain America blanket and shared custody of it for years after this encounter. So, to the men who terrorized me and my friend in a shitty apartment complex, let's not meet again. I met a guy in college and ran one lap with him. He asked my name and I told him. He was hitting on me, but I said no. Anyway, I was going through my emails a day later, and he sent me a schedule of when we will run together. I was shocked, because to find my email in the college system, he had to have gone through everyone who has my first name in the system. He would watch me so intensely whenever I ran or shot basketballs at the rec center. It was so intense, people actually noticed and told me he would hide behind equipment and stare. That part was a little funny to me at least. His hiding was terrible. He kept hitting on me in person and wouldn't take no for an answer. He grabbed me by the arm forcefully on one occasion, and another said that he was my boyfriend. Obviously he wasn't. It's funny, because I told my best friend and she didn't think anything of it, but one day, my best friend texts me and says come to the dining hall. I did. There was another girl. I found out this guy had a restraining order placed against him by the entire girls' soccer team. The restraining order was because he would use the same tactics against them. There's more that happened, but I'll stop it there. Before I begin, this encounter happened about 10 years ago. I was 22 years old, and I'm well aware this was a very poor judgment call on my part. My parents always taught me to help someone in need, just not necessarily to the extent that I allowed. Up until this point, I didn't have much of a reason not to trust people who may not always have good intentions. I've also had an unreasonably difficult time saying no to people my whole life and have since had the help of a therapist to do better about that. I've only told this story to a handful of people because I'm truly ashamed of my actions and potentially putting my daughter's life in danger. I was on my way to an event of some kind with my three-year-old daughter when I realized I'd left something behind in my apartment. I was close enough to home that I decided to turn around and head home. As I was pulling into the parking lot of my apartment complex, a woman was walking kind of in the middle of a driving area and began waving me down. As I pulled up next to the woman and rolled down my window about a third of the way, she gave me this story of how she works at the nearby nursing home and she'd run out of gas on her way to the gas station and was asking for directions to the gas station. I didn't think much of the fact that she was roaming around in my apartment complex because it was pretty common for people to cut through as it sat between two main roads and avoids traffic lights. I gave her directions for a five minute walk to the gas station, but she mentioned that she was pregnant and she wasn't feeling well. I tried telling her I was in a hurry and assured her it was a very quick walk, but she begged. At this time, she noticed my daughter was in the back seat. She had a look of surprise that I didn't think much of at the time, and she began talking to my daughter and made her laugh. She turned back to me and asked one last time if I could just drive her to the gas station. At this point, I just gave in. I let her in my car and she almost immediately asks if I have any money she can use. My heart sank at that point, realizing she was probably lying and just wanted to lie her way into some cash. I was honest with her and told her I was broke and also didn't carry cash on me. She pointed out another resident in the complex and asked me to drive her to them. In my mind, there was still a slight possibility she needed gas, but didn't have the funds for it. So I drove her to the other person and she rolled down my window asking for money. They said no and she pointed out another person. At this time, I told her I really had to be somewhere and couldn't keep helping her. 
I drove her close to the other person, but far enough that she would have to get out of my car to talk to them, which thankfully she did. Once she got out of my car, I sped off and drove to my destination. I told my mother about this story, and a week later, she sent me a clip from the local news. The news mentioned a woman who would approach people asking for a simple favor, which led her to asking them for money. If these people said no, she pulled out a syringe or needle of some kind and would threaten to stab them with it, and did end up stabbing them on one occasion. I look at the image of the person and instantly recognize this is the woman that was in my car. I know these types of people don't have much of a conscience, but I truly believe the fact that my daughter was in the car that day is what kept that woman from stabbing me. I'm not sure if I'm being irrational in my fear, so I thought it best to post about it to see if others agree or not. I love going on walks by myself. I struggle with mental health issues, and my walks alone, especially on sunny days, have been one of the only things to help alleviate my spirals and such. About a week ago, I'd gone on one of my walks like normal. I started it, and had noticed a guy on a motorized bike pass by the street in front of me, and had the thought of, that is the guy that was hanging out at the gas station who was eyeing me the last time I went out on a walk. But other than that, I was like, I'm sure he's just going on a ride, and I don't think too much about it. I walked down a few blocks just listening to my music and enjoying the sun when I saw him again two blocks down, crossing the street. But this time, he'd stopped in the middle of the road mid-crossing the street, and I saw him looking in my direction. They set an alert off in my head, so I took my headphones off while I continued to walk so I could have a bit more awareness of my surroundings. I decided to turn right on the block I was on because I was not wanting to meet up with that guy. As I got down towards the end of that block, I heard his bike again, so I turned to see if he was in eye shot. He was. He was at the church on the next block over on the same street, parked, and he was looking in my direction again. I only looked for a couple of seconds because I was scared if he saw me looking at him, he would think I wanted to talk to him. The road I was on leads directly to an isolated road where there's a large field and not many houses. That's the usual path I take on my walks, but I had a very strong gut feeling telling me not to go that way this time so I turned the corner onto the street that takes me directly back to my house. It felt almost as if he was waiting to see which direction I was going to take, because as soon as I turned, I heard his bike rev up again. I was starting to feel quite panicked, so I started to like rapid fire text my boyfriend, just as a someone needs to know my location type of thing. As I got to the block in front of my house, ready to cross the street to head home, I saw him a block down to my right yet again, crossing the street, and he was looking around him as if he was searching. I quickly crossed the street before he saw me and ran into my house. Am I being irrational in my fear? I will say I have PTSD and deal with quite severe hypervigilance because of it, but the gut feeling was so intense, it was almost like a weird intuition thing. I haven't gone on a walk since it happened. I keep pepper spray on me everywhere I go, but I am of small stature and feel as though I don't have much strength to be able to fight off an attack, so I'm just spooked. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends but since I had to go to uni the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me because I don't like to take the subway alone at night, but since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus since the subway closes on weekdays at night. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together, but very close to each other. It's around a 15 to 20 minute walking distance between us. 
Both areas are pretty shitty. He lives near a train station, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets, because it is a corner building site leading to a patio, and then to the apartment building and its doors. I usually use the entrance door that's nearer to the subway, and on my side of the apartment. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station, and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting off the first bus, we realized we would have to wait for around 20 minutes or something for the second bus to come, and since I really had to sleep at home, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus, which sober me would have never done, but since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. So, we started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people, but nothing really bad. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I somehow got a bad feeling. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street, because I didn't want to pass him. Suddenly the guy yelled, Hey! As if he wanted to ask us something but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, run, to my boyfriend. I took his hand and ran the fastest I could while he was chasing us. We ran and ran and ran, and then made a turn to the right and hid. It seemed like he was gone so I took out my keys and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of my building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started to panic, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively and then pushing me to the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or bus stop. If we'd taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately did not call the police, which I regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for half a year after this, and I slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks because I was scared that he would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for whatever reason. I still don't know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl a few streets away was assaulted in front of her building by a guy who chased her home. I wonder if it was the same guy or just a coincidence. So this doesn't feel real. I had a full-on panic attack over it, and I'm still freaked out. We hired a photographer for our engagement and wedding photos, and after we got our engagement photos, we realized he wasn't a good fit. We didn't like the photos. He was cagey and uncomfortable, and frequently missed things. He said he wouldn't give us any refund for the wedding portion of the deposit, despite it being over a year away, and us offering to help transfer our date to a new couple. That was close to $3,000. He was honestly pretty aggressive with me specifically, despite both me and my fiancé talking to him. We agreed that we could move forward with him and look at possible solutions. A month later, he emailed saying he found another couple for our date and wanted to know if we wanted to cancel. We asked if he'd refund us, and he still said no, despite the new client. Finally, he agreed to give back a few hundred, we left some reviews about our mixed experience. We left three out of five stars. We're exceedingly kind about the parts that he did well, but we're honest about the lack of communication and him asking to hire a new client without refunding us. A few minutes later, I get harassing emails and texts demanding I take down the reviews, claiming I'm ruining his family and stuff. We told him the reviews were honest, and if he felt we'd been unfair, we would edit the reviews. No response. 30 minutes later, we're in a random town getting lunch, two hours from where we live, three states from where he is. 
I hear him call my name. He's somehow in this random town and runs down me and my fiance. He starts threatening us, saying we had no right to leave the contract. And that's not true. He left, and also, we can leave up to 120 days from the wedding. He threatens to sue us and starts yelling in the middle of a crowded plaza. I'm honestly very afraid at this point and just keep trying to escape and walk away. He gets in his car and follows us, saying we will hear from his lawyers. I felt like I was living in a fever dream. He has no legal grounds, but that was still wild. If you get bad vibes from a wedding vendor, run away. We filed a police report and are moving forward with advice from police and an attorney. We're reaching out to all our coordinators to make sure they're aware of what happened and that we're protected against him going after us or our wedding. I can't share much information, but we're safe and ensuring couples and vendors in our area are aware of what happened. I've really been trying to read through all the comments here. To those saying file a criminal complaint, in my state, individuals cannot file criminal charges. Only DAs can. I've spoken to police and filed a police report, but what occurred was not criminal. There was no stalking. If he finds us again, I have a paper trail to prove what happened. Similarly, there is not enough of a pattern of incidents or level of harassment for me to obtain a restraining order. Regarding the contract, it was a non-refundable deposit. We could have tried to fight for the money back once he started trying to leave for a new couple, but we had no legal grounds before that. Although he said he wanted to work with a new couple, he never explicitly asked to be removed from the contract. And based on all the facts and everything the two of us could find, we didn't have something completely solid. We are busy and it just wasn't worth the stress. We'd already been fighting this guy for months. What he did was crazy, but I'm not going to dox him. People who might book him will know about this though. Each year around this time, I open up my time hop app and I'm reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball sized black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner at the time's apartment at around 3 a.m. She was out with co workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute would be another half hour or so and my phone was dying. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner, being thoroughly annoyed with me, was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance gate to her apartment community and sulked. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation all alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point my phone was dead. I didn't have enough cab money and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parker walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, Are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, for a split second, he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-aged girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3 a.m., completely alone. But, at 3 a.m., you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an X-Acto knife and then asked, You sure you're okay? 
He picked me up with one hand while repeatedly striking at the back of my hood with the knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight, flight, or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to stop, but after the longest 30 seconds or so of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat. That came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head. My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes later. It was really a blur. I definitely went into a state of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone, stayed awake for the police to come and take a report, but we didn't hear much else afterward. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come of it. What scares me the most is that number one, I still don't know what the man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the transit station to the apartment complex, which was a fairly long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. Ski Mask Man, let's not meet again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Walk Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Steven Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Biltron, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Ember Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Plays 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Q, 
Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoed, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.